Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach coming to you from the Las Vegas Strip. And today we will discuss day rates, kit rentals, getting paid on time, and depleting our retirement funds, all on Light Talk. And this is Stan, and believe it or not, I'm coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Whoa. Long Beach, California. Wait, are you at my house? What I am. I'm here? downstairs. Can you not see me? <laughs> Live from the kitchen. Live from the kitchen. And this is David, also coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Four Lumen Brothers. <laughs> you thought there were only three, but... There's, there's like nine of them now. How, how the hell did this happen, Stan? I mean, uh, th- you're here now. Yeah. Well, how, how did you end up at my house? Yeah, it wasn't, what's what's it, going it, on? It, it wasn't in the plan. Um, but like I've been telling people, you know, we've been isolated for two years and we're out traveling for the first time and we are extremely rusty. So how did we do this? Well, first I took, first I fell down while trying to shoot a basketball. <laughs> you fell down? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, you should see the concrete, man. It looks bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this explains a lot now. Right. Okay. This ex- <laughs> right. So the concrete looks like shit and and um I'm recovering um I hope. And then uh, you know, when we made hotel reservations, we forgot how it works. So like when you say you want to be there from November 5th to November 16th, that doesn't mean you get the night of the 16th. No, you check out on the 16th. Yes. <laughs> well, of course. But if you forget how to do it, which both of us did, and they told us yesterday, hey, you're out tomorrow morning. And I said, okay, well, let me extend for a day. There was no extending because mm. every travel is weird, man. Everything sold yeah, it's out. Booked. I was yeah, like, when I was, in D- I was in D.C. and I wanted to leave early and get a car two days sooner, no cars. There were no cars to be had in Washington, D.C. Except so it's been weird. So then we were going to drive to Las Vegas this morning and stay with Brackley, which was the plan. But his house is in disarray because they don't know they're fixing the backyard, they're fixing the pool. So we were going to anyway. We ended up realizing that David has a bed, and so we <laughs> we, we bought him lunch and he gave us a bed. So we're going to stay here tonight, and then tomorrow we'll drive to Vegas and see you, Zach, and everybody else at. And Steve, I'm sure, is coming or is already there. You know, are you already there, Steve? Yeah, Zach and I are down at the uh, Thunder Down Under exhibit. uh, (laughs) 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 Did you have to wear something like like a special thing? You have to wear nothing. No. Just a bow tie. That's really Thunder Down Under. That's lightning, baby. That's lightning. (laughs) That's not only thunder. Anyway, you know, and it's amazing because I'm, uh, after we record the show, I have to head up to my canyon abode, my hacienda in the canyon. He is so with, spoiled. Uh, yeah. And uh, and so he's got the master bedroom all to himself. Him and Pam could rock and roll in my master bedroom tonight. Yeah, so I, I, I had an encounter with the basketball. Um, I had a sporting accident. And uh, I haven't shot a basketball, I don't know, decades. And so we were just out at the park. And I was doing pretty well. I was landing. I was getting swish shots. I was really impressed. I was impressed with myself. And then, you know how sometimes the, the ball bounces off the rim, it comes back on an angle, and it's going to roll like 30 feet if you don't grab it. So I went to grab it, and, um, you know, I thought, I thought I was fine. Like, I sort of stopped myself from falling, and I was good, and then all of a sudden, I fell. I went, <laughs> and uh, my hand, and my head, my hand, my head, my knee, you know, my rib. I mean, I've got it everywhere. So I feel pretty beat up. It's basically saying... I think the message is, Stan, you're out of shape. You're going to get back. No, know. I I think you need to modify how you tell that story. All right. So I, th- I think it's now, you were, you were playing a little one-on-one with uh, LeBron. That's right. And LeBron. he got, he got yes. pissed off because you were swishing so much. That's right. <laughs> Miss Steve's got it. That's right. He hit you in the back with a ball and knocked you over. Yeah. And, and then, you, then you got up and kicked his ass. That is a much better version. Yes. I take the Steve Woods version of that story. Yes, that was good. Yeah, and it is realistic because LeBron does live here. It, so, it, you know, it could it could have been down there. Visiting. Was he in San Diego down right be, right behind he me in the He may have been down there. Yeah, he, you know, you know, I thought that I saw some, somebody just swing by me and give me a little push. 
you know, yeah. and um, foul. Yeah, okay. yeah, I was shooting foul yeah. shots. So, it you sounds know. more like Dennis Rodman to me. <laughs> <laughs> he lives in Long Beach. He could have been. There you go. He could have been. This happened, in San, this happened in San yeah. Diego, though. So. Yeah. Well, here I am, yeah, California dreaming. Yeah. It's good to be in David's house. Yeah, okay. This is a Lumen Brother first. That uh, two Jews in a box, you know, at the same at the same time. <laughs> so yes, two I have Jews a question in a box at the same for time. Stan. How is David's in-home sound system? Well, you know, the last time I was here, I gave him a hard time about his lighting, and I said, "You're a freaking line designer, and your lighting is shit." So now the the lighting looks better. Uh, I have to see how it is tonight. But um, I don't know, David, you'll have to turn on the clips for me because I haven't heard him. You will hear it. All you have to do is turn on the television and go to like some great movie and you'll hear the sound system. Him it's and I are going to awesome. get drunk tonight in David's house and listen to the sound. Uh, watch an episode of Breaking Bad. Uh, the sound in that is just amazing. I got to do something to get away from the idea that I can't grab a basketball because LeBron James knocks me over. Yeah. Try, try okay. football. That's easier to hold on to. <laughs> try football. <laughs> well, all right, all right. So let's let's let's, let's just say I'm because... a good sport. Okay, <laughs> definitely. Yes, you are. Zach is in Las Vegas right now. The funny thing is, is that this show is going to be published. You know, I should publish this early. Maybe we should publish this early because normally it'll be published on Saturday, which is the day that we're actually doing the show at LDI. So maybe, you know, if I get on, you know, if I'm able to edit this thing, although so far it seems like I'm going to have a big job <laughs> editing, uh, <laughs> that I'll get it out like maybe Wednesday or Thursday night so that we can have a Saturday show. Okay. But that, that all that being said, um, uh, Zach is in, is in Las Vegas at LDI and uh, we can get a real like early peak because uh, right now, what is it? Wednesday, right? It's Wednesday. That's correct. And uh, so what's going on? Are there like thousands of people there, Zach? What's going uh, on? At are, LDI? They masked? Well, are they wearing masks? Are they wearing masks? <laughs> um, I saw someone wearing a mask. It might have been myself in a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no, no. But but are there like thousands of people there so There's, far? I mean, right on, now on is, the, is the great rush to get everything set up before all the like sessions and seminars begin. Uh, ironically, I think we've jokingly talked about before that uh, in the past – LDI has shared the convention center with the cannabis convention, but actually I'm still yeah, are they there? <laughs> see what I'm talking no, see, about. Actually, there we go. <laughs> uh, I'm in the Virgin Hotel, formerly the Hard Rock, and the cannabis convention is here mm -hmm. this year. <laughs> oh, <Yay. laughs> how long is it there for? I do not the know, but there was quite a line at the Dunkin' Donuts this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so you know, right? I mean, it's interesting funny. because it seems like right now Las Vegas, at least the parts of it that I have been to, is full of convention and trade show attendees much more than your typical uh, gamers and vacationers. Uh, so, but it's exciting, you know, it's funny when you look on Facebook, everyone we know, it's just like traveling to Las Vegas, traveling to Las Vegas. So, uh, I think this is, even though they did have in person last year, I think this is the real return to in person. So it's not going to be just the, like the real hardcore people, but you're, you know, it's going to be like a real reunion feeling, I think for everybody to be in the same space at the same time this year. Wow. That's going to be cool. Yeah, be I'm really great. looking forward to getting there. I'm going to be there on Saturday. Stan is going to be there tomorrow. And I could say, you know, I've been coming to Las Vegas for LDI since uh, the mid 2000s. And apparently George Wallace has still been voted the best 10 p.m. show every year since then. I just, I just love that billboard because it doesn't even say who voted him that. It just says, voted best 10 p.m. show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So finally, before we get started with the show, then we're going to have to end pretty soon. But I just want to tell you, I have a show opening tonight. Oh, cool. uh, at USC, it's called Flight, and it's a, a great opera. I think it was written in the late 90s. And it's about, you know, that dude who oh, he was an immigrant and uh, he got stuck at Charles de Gaulle Airport. Oh, yeah. He, he just, just died. died. 
Yes, he ended up living. He was there for for eighteen years, right? Yeah. And he passed away like two days ago. Uh, just amazingly, we're doing the show, which is based on his story. And a good friend of mine, Sean Coelty, did the projections, the video projections. Just awesome, absolutely awesome work. But the reason why I'm I'm uh, talking about this now is because you know, we always talk on the show that for our young uh, students who want to learn more about the profession, it's the contact designers who are coming into town and say, "Hey, can I shadow you?" Well, this undergrad student at USC, Jace Smolansky, did that. And I said, of course, come, you know, we're, we're going to be focusing this day, you know, come as long as you want. He came by. Really smart guy. And uh, it's funny, he's from Boca Raton, and I grew up in South Florida, so we had a lot in common, but really, really curious, just terrific. He's a sophomore, right? And, uh, you know, we're programming away and, you know, with, with professional programmers. And uh, I've got a moderate rig. Uh, I think I've got 13 movers on the show and everything else is LED. And we had a problem because one of the programs who was going to do it on Monday and Tuesday couldn't make it. And I said, Jace, do you know a programmer? He goes, yeah, me. And I said, great. So he got a job. <laughs> so not only because he's, oh, by the way, he's a huge fan of the show, right? So, you know, we were, you know, having lunch and dinner and talking about the show and, you know, how crazy Stan is. You want to know if Stan was senile yet? And I said, well, just wait the next close, week and you hear the very, show. Very, very close. I can <laughs> no, see it from that. here. He, he didn't say that. But it turned out he ended up working for us as a programmer. And he's a great programmer. So, again, this basically underscores the point we're always making to people saying, Check out who's coming into town. See if you could shadow them. You never know what opportunities you're going to have. So, and I'm going to hire Jace again. I, you know, I'm just going to hire him because he's he's great. He's terrific and a nice person. So, uh, I just want to do a shout out to him because uh, that was really important. All right, enough of that. Let's get on to the show. And uh, Steve has our first question. Yes, it comes from Joseph in Oregon. And Joseph writes, "How do you handle day rates?" I was asked to set aside three days for a project. The client agreed to my day rate. On the third day, we worked just over four hours rather than the scheduled seven. I was asked to prorate my fee. Was this reasonable on my client's part? You know, I'm just going to jump right in there and say no, it's not reasonable. Uh, you are a freelance designer, freelance technician, you are a day player. So you decided that you were going to accept a three-day gig, and your client offered you a three-day gig. I don't think it's fair for you to work two days, and on the third day, the, the client says, well, you know, I don't really need you all day. Let's just, let's just call it $100, and it's done. And, and the, reason it's not, the reason it's not fair is that you're booking work. So you could have, there's an, maybe there was an opportunity for you to work on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday someplace else, and you turned that down because you already had a gig of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So no, I, I think it's tricky. I think when the client agrees to something, uh, they need to stick with it. Now, you can choose to be generous if you want to, and maybe, maybe you were generous because this is a client that you want to keep working with. That's a whole different story. That's a completely different story. If, it's, if you have the power to say, look, you know, I was only here for four hours. Let's call it half a day and walk away friends. Then you're a better man than I. But when the client books you and says, I need you from eight to five and you've, you're there, then they're obligated to pay you. That, that's kind of how I feel about it. Uh, what about the rest of you guys? Zach, you, you do a lot of, you're a freelance designer. You don't, you don't have a plush university job. Uh, where you, <laughs> you're where not you lazy sit, bums like the three of us. <laughs> you're right. You know, you teach one class a week and play video games the rest That's of right. the week. That's what, what, I what do you think? Well, I have a funny story for you. So once upon a time, uh, in, in the world of Rock of Ages on Broadway, for which I was the designer and the programmer, uh, we wanted to add a little uh, video thing during intermission that was like, text this to this phone number to enter to win a chance or to, yeah, to get a chance to win a Sony PlayStation and Guitar Hero video game. Uh, so the producers set this all up. We had a work call. I went in and programmed it uh, and, you know, ran it a couple of times, uh, ran it with the lighting uh, pro people so that we could make sure that all the cues would work. 
And then I sent in my invoice for a half a day of programming. And then about a week later, one of the producers who, after this happened, uh, was removed as one of the producers, went on Fox News to complain about how unions are ruining Broadway. And as his example, <laughs> he cited this oh, guy no. came in, did about <laughs> 20 minutes worth of work and charged us for four hours. <laughs> And it's exactly what you <laughs> talking about. You. Yeah, I mean, he was talking about me. And it's exactly what you were saying, Steve, is that we didn't know how long it was going to take. So we booked a session, which was a four hour long session. And that being said, you know, I absolutely agree that if it's somebody whom, you know, you're trying to help out, uh, you know, you'd think that they might be strapped for cash or if you've prearranged that you're going to do something shorter than the predetermined amount of time, then it's totally fine, I think, to negotiate that. But when I was talking about doing a Broadway show and they and they they had a full work call and everybody else had plenty of stuff to do, I felt very comfortable sending in that invoice. And this producer who went on TV and complained about me sending in this invoice, uh, as I said, was then removed from the producerial team and was not allowed back in the theater. <laughs> So, you know, good. the only thing <laughs> in, my, in my mind right now, I have like a, a paparazzi who's taken a photograph of you kind of looking sideways out the door <laughs> with, with a cup of coffee in your hand. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and a, a cup of coffee and a shot of scotch, right. right? Yeah. I mean, the reality is if if you've said I need up to this amount of time, you can charge for that. I mean, the other part of this is like the old Picasso joke, you know, where – a woman runs up to him and says, can you draw a picture on this napkin? And he draws a picture in two minutes. And then he says, that'll be $10,000. And she said, it took you two minutes. And he said, no, it took a lifetime. Took the words right out of my mouth. That took the words right out. I was going to say exactly the same thing, that um, you're not, it's, it's like, it's not just labor. You're not, you're not an assembly line worker. And so, to, you know, I think Steve is right. You know, you made an agreement. You should, you should keep to it. You, you may have turned down all the work. Like when we travel as consultants, and you, I'm sure you do this too, Zach and Steve. When David, you get paid for travel time because that's time, that's time you can't we're working on something else. It's not productive time, and so I think, yeah, I think it's just sort of cheesy of that person to want to do that. It just says speaks more about them than than it does about you and the way that they want to conduct their business. Um, it's is it worth it? You know what you're saving to the relationship that you might have. I just think there's so many. Like, why would you do that kinds of questions come up for me? Um, I, yeah, and, and that the point about, you know, it, it, you know, it doesn't, it, you didn't just do it in 20 minutes. It took you years, decades. They're, they're, they're also paying for your judgment and your creativity. And so when you do that, it's just sort of like, you know, it's not like, you know, even if I say to, it cheapens the whole thing. Like, even if you like an auto mechanic might say, you know, I'm, you're paying $200 an hour to the auto mechanic, let's say. But really, the mechanic's maybe getting $50 an hour. The guy's got overhead. The mechanic's got years of training. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, that's not what you are. You're, you're, it's, it's, I just think it's sort of like bad for that person's reputation, I would say. And, um, and I would also maybe say to, the, to you, when you do those negotiations, uh, don't do verbals. And if somebody's not, yeah, if somebody's not willing to sign something or agree to something, yo, oh, don't you trust me? Sure, trust but verify. You know, so it's like it's like you want to behave, per, or at least in an email. So at least you have something that is, you know, I'm willing to commit, and you're willing to commit. There's something to to the sacredness of a of a contract between two people in a business agreement, and. You know, back in the old days, uh, talk, we're talking about Jewish stuff early. You know, most of the Mishnah, most of the J ancient Jewish laws are about how to conduct yourself in business. Because that's, such a, that's so much a part of life that shows your character and your integrity. And I think that person should just do a little reading. Okay. Joyce from New Orleans asks, As a freelance designer, I seem to have problems getting my clients to pay me on time. Any suggestions on how I might run the business side of my career better? Boy, you talk about a good segue. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect segue, actually. I mean, yeah, I think th I think this this show should be titled "All About Money." <laughs> well, all about integrity. Well, I say all about integrity because you know how integrity. you handle integrity. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
you know, okay, how do I get my get my clients to pay me on time? Um, it is a business. That's why, you know, you heard I thought it's really called show business. It is a business. It is a business. It is, absolutely. And uh, that's why it's so difficult because we're such nice people. We're artists and theater people. We love everyone. Uh, there's a lot of kumbaya and all that. But then you have these unscrupulous producers and, and artistic directors, some of them. Uh, not all of them, obviously, but we have all met our share. And uh, for some reason, they're holding off on paying you because they think that you're not going to care. You're not going to cause a ruckus. And after all, you're only making $2,000 for the show. So, you know, how much could that hurt? And what power? You're not going to be able to get an attorney. You're not going to be able to afford this stuff. So why not just delay payment or worse, not pay you at all? Okay. This is what you do. First of all, never do a show without a contract. Ever, ever, ever. At least a simple letter of agreement saying how much you're making for the show, what your fee is, and when you expect to be paid. What date? Usually, uh, in most union contracts, you get paid in thirds. You get one on signing the agreement, one third. So, like if it's like three thousand uh, dollar fee, you'll get a thousand dollars as soon as that contract is signed, and that's important because if they don't pay you anymore or they don't pay you at all, then you just stop working on the show. Okay, but let's say they pay you a thousand dollars, and then the next payment happens when you send all your plans in, whether light plot, hookups, all your all your paperwork. Uh, then you should get your second thousand dollars. Now, if they don't pay you, then then you don't show up for the show. You don't worry about that. You you can walk away and still have a thousand dollars in your pocket. But if they do pay you, and then you go there, you focus the show, you cue the show, and on opening night, that's usually when that third payment is due. And if they don't pay you, then then you take them to what we call small claims court. Anyone can sue in small claims court. And especially, you can't do it if you don't have a written contract. You must have a written contract. And that is why you always get that written contract. And if you're working with a friend, they say, oh, we don't need a contract. You and I are friends. Aren't we friends, Zach? And Zach says, yeah, we are friends, but this is a business transaction. And I don't, this is the way I do business. And if they don't want to sign it, don't do the show. The only thing I the only thing I do differently than David is that I collect my third installment at the first preview. Usually that third installment is done at the first public performance, but I do the mm -hmm. first preview. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Yeah, there, there's an additional layer of complexity to this when you're talking about it, like a Broadway show where you might also be getting residuals. Uh, you know, you get a weekly. Uh, what do they call it? Additional weekly compensation, and oftentimes, a AWC. yeah, and yeah. oftentimes your AWC is staggered based on the box office for that week. And uh, there have been many times where I've had to fight with producers to get them to pay that in a timely fashion. Uh, a lot of times, especially if a show is starting to not sell as well, they might ask if they can withhold the AWC, and our union has some very specific rules about how long they can request that, um, for how many weeks they can request that. And it, at a certain point, you're just, you know, you, you, you never want to be that guy, but sometimes you want to say, if you can't pay this, you shouldn't be running this show if you can't pay us. Um, but yeah, it's definitely uh, a problem. Uh, one of the things that I have heard outside of the specific theater contract uh, I know you guys had uh, Bob Boniel on the show once before, and he had told me that they put something in some of their contracts where uh, if, a sh if it's not paid within 30 days, then there's a fee that's incurred, a percentage fee, so that you know it just keeps going up higher and higher if it hasn't been paid on time as a way to motivate uh, an employer or a producer to pay you on time. I was gonna. I was gonna say that in my world, it's a little different now because I'm doing the consulting and and with one third, one third, one third. That's that's been traditional in theater and entertainment. We do like this, like five or six phases in architecture. Um, and what's interesting, and what we do, what exactly what you mentioned that Bob does is on it, our invoices. Well, first of all, you should have an invoice. So what should you do? You should send invoices. So you should build one. Get your logo on it, make a nice invoice, and at the bottom of every invoice that we sent, it says payment is expected within 30 days of receipt. 
Now, we have not had the need to go as far as Bob has and say, usually it's 1.5% for every month that you're late, you start tacking it on. But if that's in your agreement, you know, that late payments will be assessed the fee. Then if you have to go to small claims courts, you'll have that, that that was not a, a secret, that that was out there. Um, sometimes what's weird, I don't know if this happens in theater these days or entertainment, but sometimes like when we're working on a big project, there are so many different specialists and different specialists are at different, um, let's say, finish points in the same phase of work. So we might be done with that phase and we'd want to bill for 100% of that that segment of the work, that third, if you will, or whatever it was. And other people are like, they're not anywhere near finished. So sometimes, because we're sort of small potatoes, the architect will say, well, go ahead and bill us for 95% of this phase and we'll pay you. We haven't been paid from the owner yet. So they don't have the money, but they have enough capital that they can give me my 95% and then tack the, 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 the remaining 5% balance on your next phased invoice. But I think to answer uh, his question is, yeah, set up a real process by which you would like to work. Right, and you you would like to bill and make that clear to your client, and then be consistent about it. And I think you know if somebody's really a professional on the other end, they will appreciate that, as opposed to I, there's a fear that we have that it will push people away if you're too prescriptive. But I would say if you push them away because they don't want to work and make clear agreements, then maybe that's somebody you don't want to work for. And I, I would add just to touch upon what Stan is talking about that it might be really good for you to for for uh, people to educate themselves about the different terminology between theater and architectural or corporate clientele. So, you know, like that first payment that's due upon signing in theater, uh, in architectural world, we sometimes call it a mobilization fee, you know, things like that, and learning about what phases are, you know, in terms of architectural things. Because really, a lot of these things are the same. They just have a different name. Yep. And if you say the... Yep architectural thing to a theater person, they're not going to understand it. And the theatrical terminology to an architectural person, they're not going to understand it. So it's good to learn the different terminology between those disciplines. It's a great point, Zach. In fact, I teach both. And in fact, I think that theater would, uh, I'll make this statement and then people can throw apples and tomatoes at me. But I really think that theater should adopt the architectural phasing process Ooh. because it's, un okay, because it's <laughs> understood globally. Yeah, like if you work in an Asia, you know where, where you're working, that's sort of a sort of a standard, and it really does work for us. It really is the same thing, but um, like for they'll call it programming, and we might call it script analysis, or they'll call you know concept meeting. I mean, it really is the same stuff, but in some ways, um, I teach my students that, and and what they don't really, what they kind of at first can't do is they don't know how to slow down. They're, they're like, want to hurry up. And the architecture process is slower. Yeah. So you get a chance to reflect on your choices and analyze how they interact with other disciplines. There's something really kind of creatively good about that. But I would just submit that we should really consider that in our industry of adopting their phasing processes, both for billing and for creative process. Interesting. Julius in uh, Portland, Oregon says, uh, I've been working for five years in the profession and my folks just asked me if I have a retirement plan in my future. How did you guys or freelance designers plan for retirement? Well, ooh, what's that great quote that people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan, right? So I don't know. I mean, nobody taught me anything about stocks or investments or bonds or anything when I was a kid. I wish someone had or I'd be a lot richer I think, first of all, you should start with with listening to um, that wonderful podcast, uh, Artistic Finance, that uh, Ethan, Ethan yeah. Steinler was. I would start with that. He's got a lot of really great people from no, it's, our it's industry. Skip my episode, though. <laughs> and, uh, don't, do not listen to no, my episode. No, watch, listen to David's uh, or, or, for it's great no, for no, comedy. It's, dude, it's, it's comedy, <laughs> yes, yes. For entertainment, it's great. Don't follow my advice. <laughs> yeah, but David, your retirement's working out pretty well. You know, we could. This is a very, very deep subject, um, but five years. So it's. I'm assuming that Julius is young, five years in the profession. Let's say you're in your 20s and 30s. You know, I like to tell young people this: if you take a penny and you double it every day for a month, at the end of 30 days, you're a millionaire. So, 
So you need to understand that it's not about how much you have to start planning for retirement and putting something back. It's about time. So when you're young, the thing you and, and time really literally translates to money. So, um, and you can't just save it under your pillowcase. You've got to put it into things that will grow to stay at least even with inflation, if not ahead of it. So you do need to learn about stocks and bonds and all those kinds of instruments. But the simplest way is open an IRA or a Roth IRA. Even if you put $10 a month, it doesn't matter. Just start getting in the habit of putting back something every month for retirement. In an IRA is probably the best place to start if you're just getting going. And and that can always be transferred. When you get enough, you could maybe start to bring get an, a financial advisor at some point, but in the early phase is not necessary. And um, start to educate yourself. I mean, I got a small inheritance when I was in my 30s, and I, st- I bought a subscription to Money Magazine, and I just started reading. So start reading, start educating yourself. And uh, I think all of us could go into different details on it, but I think get, st- get started with that right now and then start to read. The only thing I can add is if you're lucky, uh, you can marry someone who's much more financially responsible than you <laughs> are, like I did. <laughs> marry marry up, into it. it. There you go. That may be the best advice of them all. And say our union, you know, has a pension plan. You know, one of the things I remember back in the 2000s when I was organizing the projection designers is I said, hey, you know, there's a way we can turn this job into a career because part of what I think defines a career is having health insurance, having uh, access to retirement plan, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of the pension and welfare that that's paid to the union when you uh, have a theatrical contract is that th- that you're paying, not only are you contributing into that pension plan, but that it's paying for the union's uh, financial professionals to keep that pension alive where many industries pensions are dying currently. But uh, our union has been very lucky and smart to keep juggling it and moving it around to keep it growing. Um, and, th- and then there are so many places where you can go, go and get some free financial advice. You know, if you're a freelance designer at some point, hopefully you have some success. Your taxes are going to become more complicated than you can do by yourself. And you're going to bring in somebody who can help you and hopefully they'll have some advice too about how to be more efficient and how to uh, take some of that money you're making and put it aside. Um, But really, I think uh, acknowledging that you do want to have an opportunity to retire (laughs) and have a plan for that is the first step. And so that's good. They have no choice. You're going to retire. It's going to happen. It's like there's no choice. You are going to retire at some point unless you die first. So you might as well get ready. Yeah, the alternative is worse, as they say. You are listening to Light Talk, and today Light Talk is sponsored by... Just in time for the holidays, it's the Total Bastard Projector Set, Wendell Harrington Edition. (laughs) With our optional prism lenses, you can surround your guests and fill the house with projected holiday images suitable for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. You can decorate the kitchen, the living room, the dining room, or even the exterior of your home with the most beloved of holiday greetings. Holiday greetings you have come to expect. Greetings that are a traditional part of the seasons of love and joy. And best of all, it comes with three beloved pre-programmed holiday greetings we have all shared at one time or another. And who among us doesn't remember that Thanksgiving when your dad greeted you at the front door and said, when are you going to get a real job? Or (laughs) move on to that family Christmas party with a traditional greeting of, have you gained some weight? (laughs) And when the lights dim on New Year's Eve, even mom will light up the rec room with, When are you going to get married? (laughs) Our holiday projector is waterproof, so mom can use it outdoors. Now, as you drive away, the last thing you will see in the rearview mirror will be, I want grandkids. We will even (laughs) throw that one in for free. It's our (laughs) gift if you order today. How do you know you're getting genuine Total Bastard products? Just look for that caveman holding the roll of gel. 
total bastard. Our name says it all. And now, back to Light Talk. (laughs) Well, the sounds of those rabid monkeys prancing about the studio in little elf costumes once again tells us that it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about passion versus a paycheck. How to keep the spirit that we all had when we started. Well, this came to, uh, <laughs> to my attention this morning, actually. Part of it had to do with working with Jace all week and his enthusiasm and curiosity and excitement. And also, I had two students uh, this morning, one the projection designer, the other the set designer for the school production of Rocky Horror Picture Show. And uh, they were so excited talking about this show. Uh, the show uh, closed like two nights ago, and uh, I had them come in and explain to the students, their colleagues, what their approaches were and everything. And I have never seen so much energy in my life. And I thought back, you know, when I was 19 years old, I had this. I had this ex- incredible excitement. But then over the years, it seems like that excitement gets a little less powerful, a little less powerful. That enthusiasm, that spark, that joy. And because we, a lot of this becomes a business, you know, I guess there's a big theme to our show today. And it's about business, but it's also about art and keeping the passion. So what do you guys think? I mean, <laughs> how do we keep that passion? I've been thinking about it since you brought it up today, David. It's like, and I'm still thinking about it in a reflective way. There's something about newness, right, versus oldness. Like if you were, if, David, if you were working on a brand new opera, for example, or, or Zach, you had a brand new Broadway show, a new show that was never done before, would you, f- I think you might feel more of that spirit, that passion, that en- enthusiasm for newness. But I think when you've seen the same movie six times from Sunday, you know, it starts to become old so i think in some ways i think artists to keep to keep renew themselves you know push themselves beyond what they've done before or do something different you know i'm meeting heather carson this week this weekend this week and i always respected her because she went from lighting opera and theater to being like a fine artist right and doing that and she found another passion or she's still it's still about light so i think there's a there's a somehow a, a spirit of renewal that can occur but i think for, for young people, it's, it's new. And when it's new, it's novel. And when it's novel, there's a dopamine rush. And when it's not so new to you, it's routine, that dopamine rush is, is not as enhanced. But, you know, here's the deal. I've been playing music since I was 12 years old. You still love and it. I've been playing, and, I, and, I, and I've been playing in bands since I was 13 years old and playing it live since then, professionally. And I still play in bands. And whenever I go and perform, that it's back. It's there. It's there. And I think the difference is, is that as designers on a production team, uh, there are so many other things we have to be concerned with. You know, budgets and the whole process of building and focusing and dealing with uh, issues that come up in the production. Whereas when I play a gig, I set up my equipment, I play three hours, and I tear it down and I go home. None of that's there. I don't, I don't deal with any of that. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one, you know, I, I tell you guys a lot of stories that have these great quotes or chestnuts of knowledge from the different people I've worked with. And one of the quotes that I probably say more than any other quote of advice that I've ever heard anyone give was many, many years ago, I had an assistant <clears throat> And he was kind of like down in the dumps on a dinner break because he just felt like the show we were working on was not the meaningful piece of theater that he had hoped uh, to work on when he got out of college. And our friend Driscoll Otto pulled him aside and said, part of this job is you have to find a way to fall in love with every project that you work on. And sometimes falling in love with it might mean being in love with the fact that you're currently employed as a theatrical worker. You know, it doesn't always have to be that it fulfills your soul uh, and your need to, for artistic expression, but that you're, you're 
alive and working in theater. And uh, I took that to heart too. And I have come to realize for myself that a part of what uh, the passion of this creative process is to me, uh, you know, I've talked before, uh, especially in the episode where we had Dave Gallo on, uh, about my father, who was also a scenic designer, and he passed away in 2008. And that I have found that, you know, this working in this medium is something that helps me stay connected to my father. And that is enough to keep me motivated to do it. And also, you know, when I'm not working, I feel that sort of, you know, the the pain, the pangs of like how I need to be connected to to that relationship again. And, you know, whenever I'm in the creative mode, I feel that connection again and it, it fulfills me and that's what drives me. And it's interesting because we talked about all these other things about getting paid. And there, I think a lot of the rules and regulations in our industry uh, uh, exist because so many of us are so passionate about what we do that if it weren't for these rules and regulations, we probably would uh, not be very good about getting paid because we love it. We, you know, we're doing this out of love first for the most part. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of people that become theatrical designers because there was a job opening. It's because there's a love and a passion for that art. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting question to think about, you know, how you get something out of it and how it kind of fills your soul in, in many ways. What do you think, Steve? I agree. I, I, I get that question a lot from students. Um, how do you know that you like something? How do you know you've made the right decision and you're going into the right uh, field? Um, and again, I, I think you've kind of nailed it. I think, or, or Driscoll has, I think when you go into the theater, you have to find a reason to be there. And you have to be a contributing member of that design team. You know, I've, I've worked on some real dogs in my life. But I've also found pleasure in working with them. So I, I, I think you, it, once you lose the passion, um, you know, you're kind of lost. It's not even paycheck. Um, it's when you're just showing up and you're doing, I, I hate to say the minimal amount of work, because I don't think you're doing the minimal amount of work. But when you're doing the work and there's absolutely no joy in what you're doing, and you're not bringing any kind of joy to the people around you, um, you're just there, and it's you're just kind of a, a dark spot in the room. Um, you know, you you need to go on a sabbatical. You need to go on. You know, you need to go do your bucket list for six months or a year and see if you can re-energize yourself. And if you can't, you step away from it. And there's no there's no shame in that. You've just reached a point where you've said everything you have to say. And you're moving on to something that on to something else. I mean, musicians do that. Circling back to David, you know, they find that they're not they're no longer interested in pursuing that type of musical writing they're doing, and they move into a new genre. And yeah. all of a sudden, some, something else happens. A actors do it all the time. You know, we said, you know, we we want Harrison Ford to be Han Solo for the rest of his <laughs> life. I mean, it wouldn't be a very exciting career for him. I was just going to say that. Listening to what Steve is talking about and the musicians moving on to a new genre, I'm, I'm, I'm a novelty seeker. So I have been called that. So I'm, I tend to want to, after a while, something becomes routine for me. And maybe that's the artist in me. I got to find something else. So I would say if you're reaching the point where that spirit is not there for you, like Steve says, then find something else. And, and I have. And even though it's still light in a lot of ways or it's still the, theatrically based, but you know, I've done everything from throwing pots to driving trucks to you name it. And I just get bored. So, and boredom, I heard a great quote the other day, um, the cure for boredom, Steve will like this, the cure for boredom is curiosity and curiosity has no cure. All right. Zach has the last question of the day. Danny in Comac asks, I have heard that some designers charge for a kit rental and others may actually rent all their hardware and software for tech. What are your thoughts on this? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think, uh, you know, uh, what's interesting about this 
in the theatrical world is there's a set of tools that all of us are expected to have, whether you're a lighting designer and you're expected to have Vectorworks and Lightrite and other software like that, or a projection designer who's expected to have your own computer and your own copy of Photoshop and After Effects. Uh, it, what I've always found that's interesting in theater is that the sound department has managed to leapfrog over all of us and convince producers that everything they use has to be rented from a shop, whether it's down to like a mouse and a monitor to the computer and the software. Uh, whereas the rest of us are sort of expected to provide this library of stuff uh, that some of which costs a lot of money. I mean, Vectorworks is not cheap. And if you're an early career de designer, that's a humongous uh, expense. I mean, that's why you see so many regional productions has the student watermark on the Vectorworks plot because they just can't afford to make it to the professional version. Uh, so one of the things that I've uh, learned about is, is outside of theater in a lot of other industries in film world, uh, in architectural world, there's this idea of this kit rental. So you kind of put a value on your kit, your computer, the software that you have, et cetera, et cetera. And you might charge for a day rate or a weekly rental rate for your kit. And this is to help defray some of the cost of owning all this stuff that is basically an unspoken requirement in the theater. I mean, the, the other way to try to do it is to, you know, in your fee, accommodate that. Or if you have a budget, accommodate a little extra to help cover the cost of all this software. But it's an interesting question because I think, you know, we don't really talk that much about we talk a lot about what software should I know? What software should I own? But we don't talk a lot about who should pay for this stuff. Uh, and especially if, if you're working in a venue or on a project where there's a specific piece of software that you need to have uh, that is not necessarily uh, something where, that you would normally have, I think that it's totally OK to approach the producers or the employer or the client and, and ask if they want to pay for this kit rental. Uh, I'm sure, Stan, in your corporate world and in your architectural world, you encounter some of this when you have to deal with, uh, you know, a lot of the 3D stuff that goes into the, some of those projects, right? Well, I want to say, I have two comments. One on the theatrical side, something that I saw some of my uh, uh, recent graduates start doing is very entrepreneurial. Uh, lighting designers are purchasing their own consoles mm -hmm. and other and even fixtures and then they get hired and they yeah, say they to the them. theaters right. uh yeah, yeah. They, they, they include the the console for the run of the show they might even include some of the fixtures so their own little kind of side rental agency with their artistic thing and, and that's really helping them build capital and to just to look back and to fund their retirements right so that's really very entrepreneurial i think that's kind of a cool way to go uh, yeah, on the architecture side, for example, you know, a single de a single license of AutoCAD, you know, not AutoCAD Lite, which is less, but but a full blown 3D AutoCAD, that's 2,400 bucks a seat. So you're gonna have to figure that in. And like for me, my 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 liability insurance and all the, it's called overhead, you know. And so you do have to kind of think about the, the cost that you have to do the work that you do including your retirement, including if you got to have health care. If you're a freelancer, you got to start building that into your fees. And when people push back, you got to have an answer to, well, look, this, 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 and this. Uh, really expensive in the architecture world now is BIM 360, which is this building information management and where everybody's working in the same model, right, at the same time. And for most of our projects, when the ar architect is using them, they kind of cut us some slack because they know it would cost us a lot to be in BIM 360. Um, but I think as we move forward, we're probably going to have to suck it up. And that'll mean our, you know, when we, we tell people our hourly rate, they go, wow, that's a lot of money you make. Well, not so fast. When you think about all the expenses, it's not as much as you think. So um, yeah, and I think that's that's true. Those are large overhead costs and people in architecture, if you're not using auto, and Vectorworks is not happening in the world of architecture. That's a some people are small offices, but everything is Autodesk, right? It's the big gorilla on the block. So you've sort of got to be working in that. 
Uh, and Bluebeam, which I, ironically, Bluebeam Review, which I think the theater would love, is like PDF for, um, and that's not too expensive. That's a Nemechek product, and, I, and everybody has adopted it in construction. So, yeah, uh, definitely you have to start to consider um, all of those items. But I'm, I'm for it. I'm for folding in those costs and the entrepreneurial thing that people are doing with not just bringing their design sensibilities, but also bringing some hardware along with it, which is actually an, a value add. Well, during the pandemic, I started moving back into uh, uh, small uh, film shoots. And one of the things I looked at really fast was how much I was going to have to pay the government at the end of the year. And so I countered that by making investments in equipment. So I purchased um, a small uh, tungsten package, maybe a dozen lights, and a small grip package. And so for, for interior work. Uh, so I could go in and do these shoots, and here's just my fee. And it, it's kind of expected, actually, on the small stuff that you bring everything with you. So it was a, it was a no-brainer. It was just, here's, here's my fee turnkey operation. I'm going to show up. Yeah. I've, I've got a couple sandbags. Yes. I've got some C stands. Yes. I've got some lights. Yes. I have some cable. And, and just, I was better in control of what I was doing also. And within four, four shoots, I'd paid for it. You know, it was free and clear. You know, those opportunities don't come up very much anymore, but right now they do with tungsten because all this mole equipment and Ian Aero equipment is dirt cheap because people are switching to LED. So it, was, it just made sense at the time to do it. It is expensive. It's all expensive. But you get the tax write-off. That's the great thing. You invest right. something like that. You write that off as a Section 179. And again, you know, something, Stan, and we all said earlier, listen to artistic finance. If you really want to know how to do this stuff, go go and listen to Ethan Steimel's uh, fabulous podcast, Financial. Or you can just, you can just tune us in in a few finance. weeks. He's going to be on the show. Yeah, that's right. He's going to be he's oh, going to be on the show cool. again. That's right. Oh, he's never been on the show, has he? Never been he, on. Oh, okay. We're going to grill him. So send in your questions. Is he going to get financial advice, or are we just going to talk about the pod? I don't know what he's going to talk about, but hopefully, find, but maybe a little bit of both. I mean, you know, the financial advice is really important. It's a great program. As long as you don't listen to the one I'm on, and like I said, I'm telling you right now, I got to put that disclaimer I think he, out. I think he rated mine yes, highly. Yes, well, because you know what you're doing with money. I don't. <laughs> it's that simple. Right. That's because I don't have any. I got to know what <laughs> I'm doing. Know it I just piss it away. I just spend it. It's enough, right? Go, go home. Yeah, let's, let's go to the casino, baby. Yeah. Let's go to the casino. Turn over that $1,000. Hey, Zach, you've been spending time at the casino? I have not. Don't tell your wife. You were, okay, okay. Good. She doesn't, she doesn't listen right anyway, answer. but yes, I have not. <laughs> ah, that's no, smart. I think you and I have the same <laughs> problem is that, you know, we invest in stocks, bonds, and musical instruments. <laughs> that's right. You should see it. Stan will tell you there are empty boxes all over my house of keyboards. I just got another keyboard this week. It's insane. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm going to, throwing all this money away. I just to say my wife thinks about this very differently. She thinks about light talk and, you know, the way a wife should think about it. She, you know, a while ago she said, do you guys, you guys have a play date today? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, date. we have a play date today. Yeah, uh, this is pretty much it. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on just about every podcast site out there and check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate, the Snoot Group with the legal team of Sparks, Burnout, and Chase will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach and Long Beach. <laughs> and the Vegas Strip and the Republic of Texas. <laughs> and be sure to join us next week. Actually, join us at LDI when we talk about more lighting shenanigans and serve you more of our casserole of nonsense. And that's today at 4 o'clock, Saturday. Come all. <laughs> bring your fez. Bring your fez. Yes. We bringing our fezes. We got fezes. <laughs> Light talk. Broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Stay away from the basketballs. <laughs> <laughs>